Generally speaking, medical imaging studies can be divided into structural modalities versus functional modalities. Structural imaging modalities like X-ray or CT allow us to diagnose a problem when a disorder abnormally changes the morphology of something inside the body. Functional imaging modalities, on the other hand, allow us to diagnose a problem when a disorder abnormally alters the physiologic or metabolic processes inside the body. The most common functional imaging study we use in daily practice is PET imaging. However, the use of PET imaging is heterogeneous in diagnostic radiology. While it's a standard part of the diagnostic strategy for lung cancer and malignant lymph nodes, PET imaging is not a routine part of the diagnosis of renal malignancies and breast cancer. To understand why, we'll first need to understand how PET imaging works. PET imaging is based on introducing radionuclides into the body. Radionuclides are unstable atoms. These atoms are unstable because of an imbalance in the ratio of protons to neutrons in their nuclei. The radionuclides we use in PET imaging can become stable, however, by allowing a proton in their nucleus to transition into a neutron by emitting a positron. Positrons are the antimatter counterpart of electrons. They have the same mass as an electron, but carry a positive electric charge. Now, there's always a swarm of electrons buzzing around the nucleus of an atom, and whenever a positron happens to encounter one of these electrons, they annihilate each other, which results in the conversion of their respective masses into energy, typically in the form of two gamma ray photons traveling 180 degrees away from each other. In positron emission tomography, or PET imaging, we introduce radio tracers into the body that preferentially accumulate in particular environments of clinical interest. And then we acquire a three-dimensional image map of the distribution and concentration of the radio tracer within the body. We create this image by surrounding the patient with a ring of gamma ray detectors. Whenever two detectors on opposite sides of the ring detect gamma photons at the same time, we know that a positron electron annihilation event has occurred somewhere along a line between these two spots. Several billion of these sorts of events occur and get recorded during a typical PET scan, which allow us to reconstruct a visual map of where the annihilation events mostly occurred using a mix of integral geometry, linear algebra, and numerical algorithms. So how do we get these unstable atoms or radionuclides into the body and to preferentially accumulate in environments that have specific clinical relevance? The most common method you'll encounter relies on the normal mechanisms that cells in the body use to metabolize glucose. And here's a brief refresher in case, like me, you weren't a bio or pre-med major in college. Special proteins in the cell membrane called glucose transporters move glucose molecules from the bloodstream and into the cell. Once inside a cell, the glucose molecule is immediately phosphorylated by an enzyme called hexokinase. This means that a phosphate group has been attached to the glucose molecule, converting it into glucose 6-phosphate. Since the glucose transporter in the cell membrane happens to work in both directions, this important step traps the glucose inside the cell. Converting glucose into glucose 6-phosphate also prepares the glucose for energy extraction via metabolic pathways such as glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. Our most common strategy to get unstable atoms or radionuclides into the body relies on using a decoy that looks just like glucose to the cell. The decoy is a glucose molecule that simply had one of its hydroxyl groups replaced 
by an unstable fluorine 18 atom. Fluorine 18 atoms have an excess of protons, but can achieve stability by allowing a proton inside their nucleus to emit a positron and become a neutron. We call this decoy molecule fluorodeoxyglucose, or FDG for short. Glucose transporters will dutifully move FDG from the bloodstream and into the cell, where hexokinase immediately phosphorylates it into FDG6-phosphate. However, the replacement of a hydroxyl group by a fluorine atom prevents enzymes involved in glycolysis and other metabolic pathways from recognizing and processing the FDG6-phosphate molecule. This results in an accumulation of FDG6-phosphate within the cell, which is part particularly pronounced if the cell is hypermetabolic. And since all of those fluorine atoms are unstable fluorine 18 atoms, there'll be gamma ray photons for you to detect from the cell coming from all the positron electron annihilation events happening inside. Let's look at how this process plays out in the clinical setting with a real patient. The gamma ray detectors, the table the patient lies on, and other hardware are all housed in a unit that looks like this, which to many patients probably looks similar to a CT unit and a little like an MR unit. Patients are usually instructed to fast for several hours before a PET study. This helps enhance cellular FDG uptake by minimizing competitive inhibition from too many glucose molecules floating around. Fasting also prevents the heart muscle from snatching too much FDG out of the bloodstream, since fasting shifts myocardial metabolism away from using glucose as a fuel source and to fatty acids instead. A blood glucose level will usually be checked before the patient's PET scan, and if the patient isn't hyperglycemic, FDG is injected into the patient intravenously. The patient is asked to remain still until PET imaging begins an hour later. The actual PET acquisition lasts between 30 and 45 minutes. If the patient is having a PET CT instead of just a PET C alone, a CT acquisition is also done, which takes only a few additional seconds to acquire. Patients getting a PET scan are usually imaged in a supine position with their arms raised above their heads if possible. The scan coverage is usually from the patient's skull base to their mid-thighs. On CT images, like the one on this slide, the brightness of each pixel corresponds to X-ray attenuation, which is numerically expressed in Hounsfield units. On a PET image, like this, the brightness of each pixel corresponds to radio tracer concentration, which is numerically expressed as the ratio of radio tracer concentration in each pixel relative to the average radio tracer concentration in the body, normalized by the injected dose and the patient's body weight, which formulaically looks like this equation. We call this ratio the standardized uptake value, or SUV for short. If our radio tracer is a glucose analog like FDG, SUV becomes a proxy for glucose utilization. The ability to see the distribution of glucose utilization throughout the body can be quite helpful clinically, since many malignancies and infections are associated with abnormally elevated rates of cellular glucose utilization. When it comes to PET imaging with a glucose decoy like FDG, SUV values may be influenced by externalities, such as the amount of time that elapsed between FDG injection and PET imaging, the patient's serum glucose level, and the patient's fasting state. When it comes to PET imaging, we'll often incorporate a concurrent low-dose CT acquisition at the time we do our PET. 
One of the main motivations is to provide improved anatomic localization of any regions of abnormal radio tracer uptake, since PET images are pretty low resolution and depict anatomic detail poorly. Besides providing improved anatomic localization, a concurrent CT scan can also help us improve our PET images. Because of phenomena like absorption and scatter, gamma ray photons arising from positron electron annihilation events tend to be undercounted in deep tissues relative to superficial tissues. And they also tend to be undercounted in high attenuation tissues relative to low attenuation tissues. A concurrent CT scan lets us correct for these effects. Here's an example of how FDG uptake near the skin versus FDG uptake in the spine changes before and after correction. It's important to point out that the CT images acquired during a PET CT scan are usually non-contrast images, since intravenous contrast would make many organs appear higher in attenuation and result in an overcorrection of the PET image. With PET CT studies, the PET and the CT acquisitions can be interpreted independently. However, we'll commonly also look at fused images of the two acquisitions, which are made by painting the PET acquisition in a color tone and then layering the two images on top of each other. When we do this, we do have to be cautious of any misregistration effects that could be potentially misleading. Misregistration may occur because the PET and CT acquisitions are obtained sequentially and are of substantially different durations. Misregistration may occur because a patient moved a part of their body between the PET and CT acquisitions. Misregistration may also occur in areas of the body near the lungs. While a CT acquisition takes seconds and represents a snapshot of a patient at a very specific point in their breathing cycle, a PET acquisition represents an average of all of the patient's breathing cycles over a 30 to 45 minute period. Now, let's talk about the clinical applications of PET imaging in three major disciplines, starting with neurology. FDG PET imaging is commonly used to localize seizure foci in patients with epilepsy and to monitor the progression of diseases such as Parkinson's and how well they're responding to therapy. The patterns of FDG uptake in the brain can also allow us to sometimes differentiate between different patterns of dementia, such as Alzheimer's disease, which is often characterized by reduced glucose metabolism in the parietal and temporal lobes, from Pick's disease, for example, which is often characterized by reduced glucose metabolism in the frontal and anterior temporal lobes. In cardiology, myocardial perfusion PET images help us identify regions where the vascular supply of left ventricular myocardium may be compromised, while myocardial viability PET studies can show us what regions of compromised myocardium may or may not benefit from revascularization. For example, in this pair of studies, a myocardial perfusion PET image using rubidium-82 radio tracer shows us that there is a region of impaired perfusion in the infralateral wall of the left ventricle. And a myocardial PET image using FDG radio tracer demonstrates increased glucose utilization in this compromised region, indicating that this region of myocardium is compromised but salvageable with revascularization. In oncology, PET imaging using the radio tracer FDG is an extremely useful tool for spotting one of the common traits of cancer, rapid cellular growth, which is often associated with abnormally elevated glucose utilization. As you recall from some of our prior talks, there are several phases in a patient's cancer care journey. Diagnosis, staging, treatment, and assessing treatment response. And PET imaging may routinely be involved in one 
or more phases of a patient's cancer care journey, depending on the specific malignancy they may have. Because of the high amount of physiologic glucose metabolism in normal brain tissue, using FDG PET-CT to diagnose gliomas is really tough. And even if abnormal FDG uptake is apparent within the brain, it can be challenging to distinguish a glioma from a cerebral lymphoma, brain metastasis, brain infection, or inflammation. FDG PET-CT, however, may be useful for tumor grading and for assessing treatment response. For example, if we're trying to differentiate post-radiation change from residual or recurrent tumor. FDG PET-CT is of limited value with cancers of the urinary bladder, since all of the urine inside the bladder lumen contains extremely high concentrations of FDG, which will tend to obscure any abnormal uptake that might be present within the bladder wall. However, folks may sometimes use FDG PET-CT when searching for evidence of distant metastases during staging. FDG PET-CT is also of limited value for the diagnosis of breast cancer, as it tends to be tough to spot many breast cancers and also early metastatic breast cancer on FDG PET-CT. In advanced breast cancer cases, however, FDG PET-CT may sometimes be used for staging and for assessing treatment responses, such as in this case of breast cancer with axillary nodal metastases. FDG PET-CT imaging is a little more helpful with colorectal cancers. It's reported in the literature that around three out of every four FDG hotspots in the colon will correspond to a real lesion, either benign, like a polyp, ulcer, adenoma, or hemorrhoids, or malignant. Therefore, folks tend to take FDG hotspots in the colon seriously when they're encountered, and they'll take the patient usually to colonoscopy. FDG PET-CT has also um, been useful in identifying synchronous colon cancers in settings where it may have been impossible to pass the scope through the site of the primary cancer. FDG PET-CT is helpful for the detection of distant extrahepatic metastases during staging and for detecting tumor recurrence after treatment. The sensitivity of FDG PET-CT for esophageal cancer is quite good for esophageal cancers that are tumor grade T1B and higher, with reported sensitivities of up to 83% in T2 tumors, 97% in T3 tumors, and 100% in T4 tumors. However, FDG PET-CT is often unable to detect less invasive tumors, such as T1A tumors and in situ tumors, as well as superficial esophageal cancers. Increased FDG uptake has been reported to be observed in around only half of superficial esophageal cancers. The precise role of FDG PET-CT in the staging of esophageal cancer is not clearly defined, though it can be useful for detecting distant metastasis. FDG PET-CT has high sensitivity for detecting recurrent malignancy after curative esophageal cancer resections. Here's an example of FDG uptake within pleural and lung metastases in a patient with esophageal cancer. The role of FDG PET-CT in squamous cell carcinomas of the head and neck includes staging, where it's a valuable means of identifying cervical nodal involvement, distant metastasis, and synchronous primary tumors. The role of FDG um, PET-CT also includes radiotherapy planning, where it can help delineate target volumes and plan radiation dose, in addition to assessing treatment response. The use of FDG PET-CT is much more limited for renal cell carcinoma, however, mainly because of all the FDG that is physiologically excreted by the kidneys, which makes it hard to distinguish a tumor from normal renal tissue. In addition, while some RCCs are FDG-avid, others are not. However, 
FDG PET-CT is occasionally used to search for distant metastases in the context of staging and monitoring response to therapy. FDG PET-CT plays an important role in the diagnosis, staging, and post-treatment monitoring of many lung cancers, though FDG PET-CT is often insensitive for low-grade adenocarcinomas and for carcinoid tumors. FDG PET-CT is sometimes also an important tool in radiotherapy planning, helping to identify the extent of active disease. FDG PET-CT imaging plays an important role in many lymphomas. Conventional CT imaging is often limited in its ability to stage lymphoma, since conventional CT depends uh, mainly on just the size of a lymph node. CT is also limited in its ability to detect extranodal disease and bone marrow involvement since the morphological changes in these settings can often be really subtle. FDG PET-CT often does a better job of staging lymphoma than CT, and it's a valuable means of evaluating a patient's response during chemotherapy and their response after treatment particularly since it can be tough to tell if a residual lymph node on conventional CT imaging represents post-treatment fibrosis or viable residual lymphoma. In patients who are in remission, FDG PET-CT is not routinely used because of the frequency of false positives. However, FDG PET-CT may be used if it appears that lymphoma may have recurred. Here's an example of a patient with gastric lymphoma with an endotracheal metastasis. PET-CT is superior to CT and MR imaging at detecting distant melanoma metastases and has largely replaced CT and MR for staging advanced melanoma. FDG PET-CT is also useful in the assessment of treatment response to immune modulation and mutation targeted therapies for melanoma and for follow-up to detect recurrence especially in symptomatic patients. With ovarian cancers, CT and MR imaging sometimes lack specificity, and FDG PET-CT can be particularly helpful as it's relatively accurate at distinguishing between benign and malignant ovarian tumors. Though, false positives with benign ovarian lesions like cyst adenomas, endometriomas, and and, uh, mature teratomas and false negatives with certain types of mucinous tumors may occasionally occur. FDG PET-CT is also often used in the staging of ovarian cancer and identifying any recurrence. With cervical cancer, FDG PET-CT is is effective in lymph node staging of locally advanced cervical cancer and for identifying distant metastases. FDG PET-CT also may influence decisions regarding the radiation field and administered dose to involved lymph nodes. FDG PET-CT is effective in identifying recurrence and residual disease after therapy as well. The role of FDG PET-CT imaging in prostate and testicular cancer, however, is relatively limited and confined to distant metastasis detection, uh, detection in a subset of staging scenarios. Looking at this chart, we can get a uh, get a good picture of the utility and the limitations of oncologic PET CT imaging using FDG as a radio tracer. We see that FDG PET CT may be ineffective for some types of lung cancers and for many prostate and testicular cancers, and that. Physiologic FDG in excreted urine may hobble the use of FDG for kidney and urinary bladder cancers. FDG is also sort of ineffective for other cancers that don't appear on this chart, including many differentiated hepatocellular carcinomas, mucinous GI tract malignancies, thyroid cancers, and sclerotic bone metastases. As a consequence, we're seeing an expansion in the development and use of other radio tracers in PET-CT imaging. There's carbon-11 acetate, for example, 
which is rapidly taken up into cells and converted into acetyl-CoA, a key molecule in the Krebs cycle and lipid synthesis, and consequently a useful marker for differentiated HCC cells and RCC cells, since both often exhibit increased cellular metabolism and lipid synthesis. There's fluorine 18 sodium fluoride, which dissociates in the bloodstream to release highly reactive fluoride ions that readily bind to calcium, a nice marker for sites with high osteoblastic activity. There are a family of fluorine-18 labeled somatostatin analogs, which readily bind to somatostatin receptors on the surface of neuroendocrine tumor cells. That being said, FDG remains the radio tracer that's the main workhorse in PET imaging. And so, I'd like to finish with a few important caveats to keep in mind when interpreting FDG PET imaging. Now, an imaging strategy that's based on spotting cells with high glucose utilization will sometimes be susceptible to false positives and false negatives when it comes to identifying malignancies. High cellular glucose utilization in the setting of infections, common inflammatory conditions like arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, and the body's reaction to radiotherapy may all result in high FDG uptake that could be mistaken for malignancy in some cases. We also can encounter unusually high FDG uptake in skeletal muscle after exercise or in patients in a hyperinsulinemic state. This is an example of an FDG positive lung nodule that was caused by an endemic fungal lung infection rather than lung cancer. False negatives may also occur in malignancies that exhibit low glucose metabolism or if the density of malignant cells is low, such as in very small tumors or in tumors with low cellularity, like minimally invasive lung adenocarcinomas, for example. We may also get fooled in situations when the normal background uptake of glucose throughout the body is particularly high which not only limits the amount of FDG available for a tumor to soak up, but also decreases the signal contrast between tumor and normal background tissue. And last, but certainly not least, you must be familiar with the tissues in the body that normally demonstrate high FDG uptake so that one, you don't accidentally call something abnormal, and two, you understand that a potential malignancy might be hard to distinguish in certain spots. The four organs that normally demonstrate high FDG uptake are the brain, the liver, the kidneys, and the bowel. And if the patient didn't do a good job fasting and the heart is running off of glucose instead of fatty acids, the heart may appear bright too. You may also encounter physiologic FDG uptake that's elevated in a few commonly encountered situations, such as in the periareolar breast in lactating women, in the bone marrow in people who've received chemotherapy recently, in the thyroid in patients with Graves' disease, and in the thymus in children. 